and good morning. It's so good to see you on a beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. It looks like everyone survived the wind storms and the storm storms and the tornadoes and all of that this week, and I'm so thankful. Uh, we want to continue to pray for those that were impacted by those storms, even here in our own state. Um, as, I, as we start out this morning, I know there's a lot of prayer needs on your heart as well. I think of those folks on Maui and uh, the devastation that those folks have experienced. We want to remember all of them in prayer this morning. But isn't it good to gather as God's people this morning to worship the Lord? You are a beautiful crowd this morning, and I'm so thankful for your presence with us. Today's going to be a very special day as we celebrate with you um, what you were a part of, and that is our mission trip to Guatemala, and I will be sharing some about that trip and look forward to that. But I want to begin the service today with a scripture out of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. And it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Isn't that a good word? We're going to kind of camp out on that today. There is nothing too hard for you, God. And uh, I am so thankful. We have so many reasons to thank him and praise him. One of the reasons we have to praise him, we praise him for all the guests that are with us today. You are a blessing to us, and we want to thank you for choosing to worship with us today. I want to ask you to do us a favor, if you will, if you picked up a worship bulletin when you came in. If you open it up, that bottom right corner is called the connection card. And we would love it if you would take a moment and fill that connection card out for us. There should be pins in the back of the chairs. It tears out. And a little bit later in the service, when the offering plate goes by, just drop that in the offering plate. We appreciate that. I love to know your name. I love to be able to pray for you. And that helps me greatly. Any information that you will share with me, I appreciate. And also, we use that same connection card for you to make us aware of any special prayer needs in your life this week. And I hit the door this morning and the prayer request started coming in. I've already filled up my little connection card with prayer needs this morning. And uh, notes on my bulletin here. And uh, we want to remember... Um, many in prayer today. Um, but I wanted to give a word of praise because we had some little ones born uh, to our church family this week. Uh, Miss Linda, where's Miss Linda? She, there she is back there. Had twins born this week, grandbabies, a boy and a girl, Lennox and Lindy. And so we praise the Lord for these two precious ones. And also... Um, the size family has had a baby born, and uh, we praise the name for Cullen. Did I get that name right, Haley? We praise the Lord for little Cullen being born. We want to praise the Lord and pray for these little ones. And I know there are many other prayer needs. I mentioned the folks in Maui. We certainly want to be much in prayer for them and folks that have been affected by storms here uh, on uh, state side as well. Let's open with a word of prayer. For these and then we'll move on into our service father we come to you today with so much praise on our hearts father we're so thankful that we get to gather we're a people of hope we are the redeemed and lord you tell us to let the redeemed of the lord say so well, father we want to say so and we want to rejoice in god our savior this morning and uh, lord as we come as your people lord speak to our hearts today i pray that our hearts would be open to your word and what you want to do in our lives today. And Father, I pray for the one who may be here who's never trusted Jesus personally as their Savior and Lord. May today, by the power of your Holy Spirit and your living word, Lord, that you would draw them to, to the Savior today. And they would say yes to Jesus. Father, I also pray for every, everyone who maybe has wandered in their faith and has wandered away from you. Lord, they know they're saved, but they're not where they need to be. Lord, we pray that you would work mightily in those lives today. Work mightily in my life, Lord. Work mightily in our lives. We are people who need revival. And Lord, I pray for that. And Lord, we want to honor Jesus and lift him up in every part of this service. And Father, we, we just praise you today and thank you for our precious Savior. We pray today, Lord, for the precious people of Maui. 
and what they're walking through, that you would sustain them, that you would help them, that you would provide for them. Lord, that they would find their hope and their faith in Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray for that, those without hope, that they would find hope in Jesus. And Father, we pray for people of our own nation who have walked through tornadoes and storms and different things going on. Lord, we pray the same prayer for them. And Father, we give this service to you today as we celebrate what you did in Guatemala and what you continue to do. It's your work. Lord, we just get to be a tiny part of it. Lord, we're so thankful. Bless our service today. And Lord, we pray that Jesus would be lifted up and glorified in all that we do. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Would you look at your neighbor, give them a smile and a wave, let them know that you're glad they're here. Benji, would you come and lead us in worship? Please stand as we sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. chapter 5 and verse 8 where he says but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us um, so I'm four years older than my brother and, and so I thought that when I went to his football games in college or in high school rather that people would still recognize me 
And they did, of course, but it never failed that they always met me with, hey, you're Adam's brother. And so you can imagine the disappointment, like, yeah, we've got a name too. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but I think all of us, I was thinking about that, but I just share that to say that I think all of us to some degree have experienced the feeling of not being valued for who we are. But I want you to know that there isn't a truer sense of the depth of our worth than in, than in the way that God shows his love for us. You may be thinking to yourself, well, I've messed up so many times in my life. How much could God really love me? And I love when people ask me that question because I get to tell them that he thought you were to die for. Jesus willingly gave himself as a living sacrifice by going to the cross on our behalf. And as he hung there, he looked ahead of time and he saw you and he saw me even at our worst. And I can just imagine him saying, yes, they are still worth it. So if you ever question God's love for you, just look to the cross. Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you again for the opportunity to come together as a body of believers to worship and just lift up your name, Lord. I pray that every day we would just make much of you and point others to you. God, I just want to pray for the ones here today that may not feel very valuable right now. And I know that, I know what it's like to, to walk through that valley. But God, I'm so thankful that you're not just a top of the mountain kind of God. You're with us even in the valleys too. And in my experience, I think that that's more, also one of the places where we can really grow spiritually. That's because it's where, we, where you meet us, where you teach us things. And so God, I just pray that even in those low moments, that you would remind us of your love and remind us of the distance that you went to show us how much we mean to you. And I pray that we would never, ever forget it. Thank you for loving us, even at our worst. And thank you for never, ever giving up on us. And we ask these things in your own precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our Guatemala team uh, if they would make their way up here and you could sit by here. I know you guys are excited to share about our, our recent trip. We, uh, you as a church sent us to Guatemala July. We left on July 25th and uh, we came back August 1st. And it was an amazing, amazing trip. I don't want to steal this team's thunder and I want them to share from their heart uh, what they experienced. And, and I'll try to follow up the rear and fill in a few gaps here and there and then we'll move into our message. But let me just say, I could not be prouder of our church family for your love and support for all that we do in missions. This is a mission-hearted church. That's one of the reasons I said yes when you called me as your pastor. And uh, that has only continues to grow, and I am so thankful. And I also couldn't be prouder of this team that is standing behind me. They were amazing. And they, this, is, this is one trip I've told people, the ministry we did on this trip was absolutely incredible. It was also one of the most challenging trips that I personally have been on in all my years of doing missions. And uh, you'll hear some of the stories as to, as to why. But this team served through all the challenges, uh, even when they weren't feeling well, with a smile on their face and a commitment and faithfulness to serve Jesus anyway. And I'm so proud of them. And, you know, I was thinking, um, Dylan, the Bible says that the last shall be first. And so <laughs> since you were the last to arrive in Guatemala, I thought that maybe you would like to come and share first today. We appreciate you, brother. Come and share from your heart. Well, thank you, Glenn. Um... He did mention that they left me at the airport. <laughs> and so, now, uh, I want to thank you all um, first and foremost because um, our church is a church that, you know, we decided to partner with a church in Guatemala. And um, I just couldn't be more thankful that you all continue to send teams year after year to continue this, this mission work because the people down there, um, they are our family. They're our family in Christ. And, 
we every time we go down there it's just like we're rekindling those relationships and those relationships are just um, so so important and um, I just I'm thankful that that we as a church do that so I pray that that would be um, something that we would continue to do but thank you for for sending the team um, it was it didn't start out very ideal <laughs> um, so kind of the we get to the airport super early in the morning. It's like three, or we get here at 3 a.m. and then uh, we head to the airport. And uh, we get there and uh, so, you know say our goodbyes and you know we get inside and we're getting our boarding passes and we walk up and they tell us that our flight is canceled. And this guy that was helping us from Delta, uh, he hadn't either been there long or he has no experience or something, but he didn't know if our flight was canceled from Atlanta to Guatemala or Guatemala or from Atlanta to Guatemala or from Knoxville to Atlanta. So we had to sift through that and that took a while to figure out. But after we got that squared away, um, we just decided after talking to Justin and his team at Zion Hill that we're just gonna drive to Atlanta. We did not have a lot of time to get to Atlanta. <laughs> It was about, you know, the time we had to get to Atlanta to get on our flight was about the time we had of driving there. So, um, we, you know, we get in the van. Um, I had to actually call Haley. She had to bring the van back. She was almost home. But Zion Hill, they get in the van because they park theirs and they head, head down to Atlanta. Haley brings the van back. And um, so Glenn's like, who's driving? And uh, he offered to drive, but he did not sell me on... <laughs> on his uh, offering to drive. I could tell, I was just like, I don't think he wants to drive very much. John didn't have his license, and I don't remember Kennedy or Amy saying a word. So I got in the driver's seat, and anybody that knows me knows that I can fall asleep on a dime, especially at five in the morning, and after I'd slept for three hours. So I get coffee and snacks, and we just head down the road. And uh, we're going down the road, and we didn't really have any problems on the road except for three things. Um, I, was, I wasn't worried about my sleep because I was going good, but our tags had been expired for eight months. Um, <laughs> our tags had been expired for about eight months. I drove through the Georgia state-only express lane on the interstate, so I'm worried about that. I'm not on the insurance to drive, but we just did it anyway. <laughs> and and, and we, got, we finally get to Atlanta. And uh, we get there, we're on the phone with Justin, he's giving us these details about how to park. I pull in, I make a few wrong turns, but I finally get to the International Terminal. Everybody runs out and they get inside. They're getting their boarding passes. I'm sitting there in the um, park, like in the lane right outside the terminal. And airport security hates it if you sit there. So I'm just sitting there a nervous wreck. We don't have much time at all. They're in there getting their boarding passes. Me and Kennedy finally switch out. I get up there and I'm talking to the lady at the desk and she, encourages me greatly by saying, you haven't parked the van yet? <laughs> and uh, she's like, I don't know if y'all are going to make it. So I, she's like, I'm going to leave your boarding pass right here on the desk. And when you come back, you just come through and get it. So, you know, I go park the van. They, they go on in and they're going through security. Um, and they, they're getting on the plane. So I, you know, I plug it into my GPS. I'm trying to find this parking garage. Miraculously, I find it. And I find a spot pretty quick. Um, so I get my spot, I get out of the van, I lock it, I'm just got my suitcase and stuff, and I'm determined to make it, and I just take off running. I run all, all the way to the end, get on, go up the steps, and once I get up, up the steps, I have to get on a train. I ride a train to the domestic terminal. After I get to the domestic terminal, I have to take a bus to the international terminal. And this guy, after he finally pulls up with the bus, he's like, man, I gotta wait like 10 minutes before I can leave. So I just go out and I would plead my case. I'm like, we've been up since, you know, since three in the morning trying to get here. We missed, like our flight was canceled. He's like, all right, we'll just go. So he, ta he takes me over to the international terminal. I get there, none of the people that, were said, that said they were gonna be there with my pass was there. I had to get back in line. And by the time I got to security, Kennedy calls me and she's like, we're leaving. <laughs> And I was like, okay, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, they, they, they fly off, and, uh, you know, I, I sat there, and, you know, I kind of just exhaled, and I just walked to the Delta desk, and I'm determined to get a flight tonight out to Guatemala. And, um, you, know, I, you know, if anybody's been in the airport and talked to somebody, you know, behind the desk, it's not fun, it's not easy. And, uh, you know, so I, I go back and forth with them for a while, and finally I get a flight 
um, that's going to fly into Houston, then I'm going to go from Houston to Guatemala. Well, right about time, you know, to board the plane to Houston, they're like, your flight's delayed. <laughs> so that puts me in a position to where if I, if I make the flight and I go, I've got like 20 minutes to get on the flight to Guatemala. So I've been on the phone with Haley for, you know, 50 times. She's finding different flights and all this stuff, and it's just not going to work out. So um, I decided to just not take the flight. I go back to the Delta desk, and I get to talk to them again. <laughs> and uh, after the lady is, you know, very difficult to deal with, I walk out of there with a free hotel room and $45 worth of food. So I guess that was pretty good, yeah. other than the fact I missed my flight. And they left me. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not better than that. <laughs> but uh, so the next day I get up and and I had told Haley the night before I was like if I if I get you know if this flight doesn't work out I'm just going to come home. So I get up the next day. Everything goes according to plan and uh, I, I make it to Guatemala finally. And uh, the thing for me to do would have been to probably just be upset with the Lord and like, I'm trying to go to Guatemala to do ministry for you. And this is what's happened to me. This is how this whole thing has been hard and it's been every inconvenience in the world. But, um, you know, that's, that's not what, that's not what I did. Um, I determined that, you know, God had used me to get the team to the airport, get them on the plane and get there so that they could, you know, do the ministry. Um, and as a result of that, you know, there was several people the next day that, that trusted in Jesus and uh, they were forever changed through the, through the medical clinic. So um, it would have been, you know, the temptation would have been to, you know, be upset about that. Um, but, you know, the Lord used it. The Lord used me and uh, I'm thankful for it. Sorry. But now that I make it to Guatemala, um, we get to Guatemala. You know, I have the first day, of, you know, my first day of ministry. Me and John's putting in water filters. You know, I've never done this before. But we go to, you know, several different homes that, that Pastor Jaime has lined out for us to go to and to um, put in these water filters. And all it is is a five-gallon bucket with a spigot. You know, it's got a little filter in it. You pour water through it, and they can, they can drink through it, and they have clean water for two years. So it's a, it's a great need um, in their community because the water there, um, whether you get it out of your well or whether you get city water, it's not the cleanest water. Like literally our, our translator told us one day that um, the water from the city is dirtier than the water from a well. And uh, we had one family that was using a sock to filter out the city water. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what they have to deal with and, and live with every, you know, every day. Um, but we, you know, we go through our first day of ministry. Um, we're going into to people's homes and, and putting these filters in. And you know, John's John's doing that because I'm not mechanically inclined to do anything, even though it's simple. Um, and uh, he's doing that. But I, I got to share with you know with every family. You know, I, I shared the gospel with every family. I shared you know my story of how Jesus has, has changed my life. And um, you know, I, I did that, and we saw um, several families that. There's not much of a male presence in any of the homes. A lot of the times, the homes that we're going into, it's it's a mom and several kids, and and you know what we would call a home is literally four metal, four sheets of metal that, um, and that's it. You know, and it's it's a dirt floor, and, and they they got their bed, and everything else is hung on a wall. And before I was going in, like when we were going in, I was like. Um, coming into this, like the town that we were in, I was like, this doesn't, you know, seem as impoverished as I remembered. But you know, as soon as we got in one of those homes, I, I it quickly came back. Like this, this is, uh, this is very hard to see, and it's very hard. But um, you know, God, you know, used that. He used all those times. Um, the, you know, in the afternoon, we were actually in a school, and uh, I was, John was able to put in some more filters. I was able to share the gospel and. There's two young boys that, that prayed to, to accept Jesus and to, to follow him. And uh, it was all through, you know, just a, a simple water filter. Uh, Angelito and Hector it, were the ones that trusted in Jesus, and I got to lead them in that. So, I, you know, I praise God that, that he allowed me to be able to, to do that. Um, and then, you know, coming into 
Friday, we, we did the same thing, um, and then we had a worship service that evening. And uh, the worship time with them is just, it's super sweet because there's no, there's no music, there's no nothing. They just sing and they clap, and, uh, and it's, it's just really sweet to be able to do that with them, even though I don't necessarily know exactly what they're saying, um, even though I try. Um, I don't know exactly what they're saying, but I know they're praising the Lord, so um, got to enjoy that. Um, and Glenn had asked me one day, um, he asked me if I would uh, leave the devotional, and uh, I wanted to share with y'all kind of um, what, what I read off, because this whole trip was not, did not go according to my plan. It didn't go according to what I had thought it would be, but... Um, there's this book um, that I've been reading called Dangerous Jesus, and um, the, the author says this in the book. He says, Loving God and others is not demonstrated by parroting catchy slogans or retweeting a verse of the day. It is demonstrated by a willingness to be inconvenienced, to be made uncomfortable, and to adjust our own lives for the benefit of other people. And that's what going on mission is. It's getting inconvenienced. It's getting in a position where you're not comfortable because we had our fair share of inconveniences. I missed my flight. Our luggage didn't, sh my luggage didn't show up when it was supposed to. It was really hot. It was, you know, hard sights to see. It was all these, you know, it was tr getting in traffic one day on our way to ministry. It was all these little inconveniences that, you know, would have been easy for us to be tempted into just saying, God, why, why isn't this going the way that I thought it would? But in actuality, we were right where we were supposed to be, and we did the ministry that God set out for us to do, and he worked through it. He, despite all of these different things that happened, God flipped all those things on their head, and, and it was able to be used for his glory. People trusted in him. People were forever changed. Um, people in the church were encouraged, and I just want to say um, to you all, um, I want to challenge everybody to inconvenience yourself to be uncomfortable to to step out and go on mission we go to guatemala once a year and uh i would encourage all of us to do that for the love of other people to do that for the glory of god to love others and you know a lot of a lot of our a lot of times our temptation is to to sit back in comfort but it's in the uncomfortable places that god really grows our faith and pushes us to be better for him and, and be in more of a reliance on him. So I just thank you all for, for letting us go, for being a mi missional church. But I encourage everybody to ask the Lord, ask yourself, what's holding me back from going? Because we we all need to go and we all need to see that and we all need to be a part of, of that discipleship of people across across the world, across different nations. So I just want to encourage you all of that and I hope... I hope uh, Thank you all so much, and uh, thank you for sending us. <laughs> Lynn said I could have 30 to 40 minutes. You guys are welcome. <laughs> He's always a little bit nervous. Um, Dylan, this is the first trip I've gotten to go on with Dylan uh, with us, so I got to know a lot about Dylan. Uh, <laughs> He's a pretty cool cat. Uh, <laughs> They, they, this team, every time that we go, God puts together the team. You never know who's going to go until it, it starts just coming together. And it's always the perfect team. Everybody brings something. Everybody, it just, he just melds us all together. Even it takes John a whole year to get over being with me for a whole week, but he still comes back. Um, <laughs> love John. Even if he don't mind me. He didn't mind me much. Just like, where's Mary Ann? He didn't mind me at all, actually. <laughs> Not one time did he mind me. <laughs> but, but for all the things that happened to us, this definitely was uh, the most, <laughs> everything was so unpredicted. And, and Glenn tells us from the beginning uh, that we always have to be flexible for missions. And we were learning flexibility in the airport when we were trying not to scream, <laughs> trying not to cry. Um, and I, I actually felt really bad for Dylan immediately when he had to call his wife to come back. Hey, uh, we don't have a flight. We need you maybe to drive us, maybe to bring the van. I don't know, but can you just come? <laughs> and she did. She's a great girl. Uh, when we, uh, we told them that some of this folly might have started because of the expired tags, 
Um, you know, it was just a life of crime. We started leaving from here, going through the express lane, all the things. You know, it was just a criminal behavior, maybe. Uh, when we got to the airport and dealing, as we were getting closer and we were realizing that some of us might not make it, all of us might not make it to this flight. Uh, and if it's not, like, we're going to really, really be bummed out because we have everything, everything is planned for us to get there, travel on this first day, and clinic begins the next day. Everything is already planned. Uh, so we have all these plans. Uh, when they, when it became very apparent that they would not wait for Dylan, um, I, I think me and uh, Kennedy had all we could do not to cry when they closed that door. The flight attendants were, they, they were hearing us and I could, I could see that their heartstrings were being pulled, but there was a man that worked for Delta that did not care. And had we stood in that door, he would have just closed us in it. He did not care. The door has to close at 10 minutes till the flight, just in case anybody didn't know that. Legally, they have to close it by 10 till they don't care about your issues, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, we cared, and we did feel really bad leaving Dylan. Um, it did hurt, uh, but and that said, it, it did start us off kind of on a on a on a, on a bummer of a note. But we have to always remember that it's not about us. None of it. Like he, he can do all this whether we go or not. Whether you guys go in my place, which hey, anybody, it's a great time. Um, he doesn't need us to do all these things, but he does allow us to be there uh, to participate and, and to work for him, and it's such a wonderful thing. Nothing that we planned uh, went went out. Like the church, this is the biggest uh, amount of vitamins uh, that you guys brought us. Like it was overwhelming uh, when we were trying to, to sort these out and put them in the bags. We had to use five suitcases to take all the things that you guys gave us, which is amazing. And you know, I followed you all. I, I just can't tell you how much all the things that we take, all the medicines that we that we pay for to go to the clinic. They want those vitamins more than anything. They want those vitamins, and you guys were. Uh, just over the top with it this year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, to say that, God was like, yeah, that is great, great job, Shiloh. By the way, we're not going to let you take two bags of vitamins. We're going to leave them at the airport. You guys aren't going to get them at all. We never got those. Dylan was able to get those the two days, uh, the day before we flew out, that we left for other teams to use, uh, that will be used. But what God did provide, uh, I said every day, God's going to provide what we need. Because not only uh, did we get there that first day with the less vitamins than we had planned to take, uh, we also didn't have two bags or two boxes of medicines that we paid for in advance that they were delivered to the wrong place. And I'll just tell you, little Maria was our coordinator. She's a little thing. Uh, she is a spitfire. Um, she stopped by a couple of times to get those medicines, and she left one day, the second day during clinic. I'm like, where's Maria? Oh, she went to get the medicine. <laughs> she was coming back with medicine, or somebody was coming back missing from somewhere, never to be seen again. She was getting that medicine. Uh, she uh, was a spitfire. I just loved her. She took such good care of us. And to say that, um, you know, we, we, we suffer because it's hot. We, we have a week away from our family. Uh, you know, you, you pay to go, you, 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 you do those things, but those guys down there, uh, like Maria had been away from her family for two weeks. She wasn't really supposed to be on this trip coordinating with us. So they just called her and like, hey, we really need somebody, and I think kind of pressured her, and so she had a very little bitty one. Uh, was he two? Was he two? Was he one and two? a half? One and a half, who was sick while we were there that, you know, she was worried to death about. So the guys that we go down that are helping us help their countrymen are also sacrificing. And you know, I, I feel like they're sacrificing more at times than we are, even though we're farther away uh, than they are. So they love their own people and they are, they are trying to help. Uh, but the day that the medicines came, that Maria showed up with those two boxes, it was the second day of clinic. And uh, I was bummed out because I'm like, we had this medicine, we, we really didn't run out of much. I think we might have finally started running short of ibuprofen and Tylenol and Prevacid which is nothing for us, we can all go to CVS, right? They can't. So those are some of the things that they're asking for. Um, anyhow, she comes up, uh, the vitamins, or the, the medicines come that day, but like the morning the for clinic, it was just really, really low. And I'm like, where is everybody? We're only here, we only got today, and tomorrow's like a half day of clinic. Where are all these patients? We don't, we're not gonna be here for another year. So I was bummed out. And even uh, Ildi, uh, you know, my twin sister that lives in Guatemala that nobody understands that we don't look alike, we do. Don't understand. We have glasses for y'all. Uh, anyhow, uh, she was like, you know, you're just, you're just not the same. And it was, we didn't have, we had all this stuff. And like, in my mind, I'm like, you know, God's got us here. He's got us here for this time. And we need these medicines right now. So the medicines came. And so after clinic, we're, we're started, after lunch, we're starting a clinic. And I'm, I'm in my little cubby. And it starts to get really loud out there. And I don't know if the pictures made it, but like, I just, I'm like, what, what's going on out there? And I just looked out and every chair was full. It's all full. God's timing, it just, 
unbelievable. I did better not cry talking about this yesterday. It's overwhelming. We love those people. They love for us to come down. And the things that we think that we're going to do for them, it's great. We have these great ideas. We've got to put these things on your heart. But you get down there, and so many things happen that you just you can't explain. Um, you can't even always remember to equate it when Glenn was asking us, like, what our biggest, like, what was the most meaningful moments? And you're, like, sitting there, you're just overwhelmed with the things that have happened, the things you've seen, the things you've experienced. <sighs> I hope some of you are having a heart for these folks down there. We need more people. Uh, this year, we, we always want medical clinic, and we want to always be able to provide that. Um, but honestly, the medical clinic, this is a Band-Aid that we're throwing for a couple of weeks. Now, I did see some sick babies, and in, and in being all Guatemala, and I then took their illness for 24 hours just to get their, their true experience. And I had to miss out a day of, of going to visit homes that I've, I don't, I've never had to miss anything for, you know, being just the, the, GI, the GI stuff that we get. Um, but it was, um, it was an incredible experience. Uh, but we need more people. Zion Hill goes with us. Uh, we're not, we, we ride together. Uh, sometimes we see them, we stay in the same hotel, but they work in a different part of Guatemala than we do. Um, they bring their youth their parents come, their youth come, and I'm just going to tell you and challenge you, you guys with teenagers, um, those kids are having experiences that you cannot give them here. It's incredible. And the things that they do, those kids can reach other kids better than I can. I can't even make John mind me. Those kids look to their other kids. Like I, you see them when they're looking at them, when, when Lauren and, and Kennedy were much younger. You know, they're coming and they are way cooler in every way. We'll just, just be honest. But those kids are looking to them and they can reach them better than I can, uh, better than Glenn can. Uh, so you all pray about that and thinking about coming down with your kids. It is safe. I promise we are safe. I've, I've never felt unsafe down there. If that's an issue, I'll be happy to talk to you. Anybody's mom, husband, granddad, any of you, I'll be happy to talk to you. I feel perfectly safe. But as a matter of fact, I threatened Glenn. A couple years ago when we kept canceling for COVID, I would go by myself and I would be fine. We have friends and family down there that keep us safe. So I'm just promise you guys, think about that, pray about that. We need more people. We need some youth. Um, just think about that, pray about that. It's, it's very easy uh, sometimes to, yes, we, we listen to these missionaries and uh, we support you. It's a different thing to send your spouse, send, send your wife, send your kids. Um, that's, that's a more of a commitment, isn't it? So think about that. Uh, do more. Do more. Do what you can. Um, like I said, we, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible week. Uh, these guys did great. John, um, Brandon's not here with us to tell, but I'm going to make sure he knows. John was a pharmacist for a day. So was Kennedy. Uh, John and Kennedy have no pharmacy experience, and they certainly don't have it reading uh, Spanish medicines. <laughs> Uh, they, they did have to come back and ask a lot of questions because even uh, um, given the instructions to the patients before we go, it's just, it can be very confusing. They did excellent. They did an excellent job. They're also helping give glasses, uh, reading glasses, to people that they can't speak with. The first day was uh, we didn't have enough translators. Uh, we, uh, Glenn uh, made a phone call and we got some translators and one of the translators that came from that church, uh, Carlos, was it? Jose. 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 So Jose comes, and like he, he immediately starts helping uh, Glenn and stuff. He was wonderful. He wouldn't take any money. We always uh, provide things, you know, for those. We, we pay those translators for their time, and he wouldn't take any money. He was just happy to help. The day that we were stuck on the bus in traffic, the last day of clinic, again, nothing went as planned. You know, I'm just, I'm looking at my watch and the time. I'm like, we're missing all these patients. Our doctor has to be done by two. I can't see patients unless the doctor is down there legally. So we don't want to be illegal in Guatemala. Uh, Carlos and his brothers came on their motorcycles, unfortunately without helmets, <laughs> but to help get us off the bus to, to offer, because, you know, just to offer, just to help, whatever they have. And they weren't offended when we were like, oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Me and Glenn went, nope, sorry, we can't do that, guys, sorry. Nobody's going on these motorcycles here. <laughs> Nobody without a helmet. Um, but they, they will come and do whatever you need. They will drop what they have to come and help you. You know, Jose dropped everything he was doing that day and came and helped us for the rest of the week. And I asked him one day if he was coming to help us the next day. I was like, do you need help? I can be here. Like he, he, I don't know what he had planned. Uh, but they're willing to drop everything. And sometimes it's hard for us just to, you know, give somebody five minutes. Um, they are a, a sweet, sweet people. 
Um, I have patients down there that I see every year. Um, they're almost to me now, like it's almost like primary care when I had the same patients coming back every six months, every year. Uh, one little fellow, Lorenzo, um, he, I saw him last year for a leg wound. He'd had a bad fracture that wasn't repaired surgically, uh, so it healed really badly. And so he's had this wound since last year. And when I was uh, looking at him, listening to him, he says, yeah, you dressed my wound last year. Well, he's wearing britches and we can't, we can't get to his wound. So Eldie, she's like, I'm just going to ask the pastor for a pair of shorts. Okay. So he goes, it's not a problem. Like he comes back in like five minutes in short so I can see this wound. We can dress this wound. And Pastor Jaime is so vested in this community and so vested in this church. Like he's over listening to all my instructions. Tell him, like, listen, you have, this has to be taken care of. This has to be kept clean. Uh, he had on a very dirty ice rack that he's probably been using for six months or more. That was his dressing for this wound that just continually drained. So somebody put money in my hand for my Sunday school class on that Sunday before I left. And so that person I went to, no, that money went to Pastor Jaime to pay for bandages uh, for Lorenzo. Um, but Pastor Jaime had already said, I'll be sure he has clean bandages. Like, he'll take it out of his own pocket. You know, pockets that are, are not full, don't have as much in them as ours do. Um, they'll give you whatever they have. Um, let's see. Well, I have, I have a lot of things written, guys. Um, Amy, we're going to have to. Okay. Okay, Glenn says that I have to stop. I was trying to get you guys out by lunch, but it's not gonna happen. Um, we do want more people. We need more people. We can do more things. We wanna go into the schools, and we can go into the schools even with this small team, but there's much more we can do with more people. So please pray about that um, and being a part of going with us next year because we're already making plans. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. I'm going to ask the others to share in the coming weeks a little bit. Um, so stay tuned because you're going to hear more from Guatemala. Thank you guys for being ready today. I did want to give you a little bit of the word today. So if you got your Bibles, I'm going to preach quick. So hold on to your hat. Uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And uh, this is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and I wanted to share with you um, one of the things we see God do on these trips. He always does more than we could ever imagine. How many of you know he's a master at that? I hope in their stories that you've heard today and they shared incredibly. Mission trips are hard. Mission trips are challenging. They're not vacations. But God always shows up in incredible, incredible ways. He's a master at that. In John chapter 6, we read about Jesus feeding the 5,000. The 5,000 was really just, they just counted the men. In their day, in their culture, ladies, I'm sorry, but they, you may have been there, but they counted the men. And they didn't count the children either. So there was probably a crowd of anywhere from, could have been eight to 10,000 people. And the scripture says in John chapter 6, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and listen at this. Here's a challenge. The disciples were facing a... They were about to face a challenge that they weren't ready for, just like we do on mission trips. Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? I can just imagine Jesus looking at one of us on the Guatemala team and said, 5,000 people are coming. Where are you going to go get bread? That was the challenge they faced. But this he said to test him, Listen to this, for he himself knew what he would do. Do you know that the Lord calls us to missions? And he himself already knows what he's going to do? And we're scrambling going, Lord, is our church bank account big enough? Can we handle it? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do all of these things? And we have our agendas and our checklists and, and our to-dos. But the Lord himself already knows what he's planning to do. Philip answered in 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. That 
that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there is this lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. What are they among so many? And then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Listen at that. As much as they wanted. So when they were filled, five barley loaves and two fish fed Probably about 8,000 people. And everybody had enough. And everyone was filled. Jesus instructed them in verse 12. So when they were filled. He said to his disciples. Gather up the fragments that remain. So that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up. And filled 12 baskets with the fragments. Of the five barley loaves. Which were left over. By those who had eaten. And then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Incredible story. You know, I think about this little boy in the story. He was the only one who brought something to the, to the game that day. He brought five barley loaves and two little fish. The disciples were going, they were counting their money. They were counting the money in their purse and they said, listen, eight months wages is not going to go to buy enough food so that everybody can just have a, a bite. And this little boy said, well, I've got five barley loaves and two fish. You can have it. He gave it all. He gave his whole lunch, BNG. He gave it all. Jesus took it. He blessed it. He instructed the disciples to begin to distribute it and everyone had their fill because all along Jesus knew what he was going to do. I love missions. God calls us to missions. He calls us to have a missionary's heart. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. Jesus already knows what he wants to do. He's already got a plan, Dylan. He's already got a plan. Inconveniences, crowds showing up bigger than we thought, missed planes. All of these things are nothing to him. Because he already knows what he's going to do. But Jesus' concern is for the people. The people who need him, the people who need the gospel. Dear church, thank you for your support and missions. We cannot let up. With all the challenges we're facing in the world today and in our own country, Jesus' command to us is still as strong as ever. Go, go, go and make disciples. I'm with you. I'm with you. And he shows up every single time with all the challenges, with the stomach bug, with, with Montezuma's revenge, I call it. With missed planes and schedules and vitamins not showing up when they were supposed to. Ten precious souls came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the devil was defeated. And who knows how that's going to continue to ripple out. I do know that everyone we ministered to heard the gospel. I do know that seeds were planted. Our God is an amazing God. Nothing is too difficult for him. And I think about this little boy. You know the greatest memory he had as he grew up into a man. I think that he was overwhelmed with that miracle. How did his little fish and, and five barley loaves, how did it feed and fill a crowd that size? He was overwhelmed with that. But I believe that as he grew up, what he was really overwhelmed with was a person named Jesus that he met. The greatest joy of his, his life was that he, he knew Jesus. He met Jesus. 
Can you just imagine what Jesus said to that little boy? If you ever meet Jesus, you'll never forget. Have you met him? Have you met him as your Savior? Today's a good day. And then there's the truth that there are needs all around. There's needs all around our world. Amen? We'll talk about that more next week. But God can use you to make a difference. He used this little boy who gave all he had. The disciples, they were counting up their money. They hadn't given anything yet. They were counting up what they couldn't do. And this little boy brought all he had. Lord, it's yours. What could God do with us, church, if we opened up our hearts and our hands and say, God, it's all yours. It's all yours. Our church bank account, it's all yours. I don't have my wallet on me. But if I had my wallet on me, I would pull it out. Whatever money is stuck inside of it, it's not mine. He blessed me with it. Through you. But it's His. And I want to be a good steward of that. This little boy said, Lord, it's all yours. God can use anyone with that kind of a spirit and that kind of attitude. And whatever we have to give is enough when placed in God's hands. Whatever we have to give is enough when placed in God's hands. It's not about what we have to give. It's about us giving it to Him and watching what He will do. Do you know Jesus? Because He's still a miracle worker. Those people had their bellies filled with five barley loaves of bread that filled them all up and the fish. But the one standing before them is the bread of life. And he can satisfy anyone who is hungry with an emptiness in their heart and an emptiness in their spirit. He is still enough. Would you bow your heads? And close your eyes. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. Lord, there may be someone here today who needs Christ. He's still a miracle worker. He's still the Savior who died on the cross for all of our sin. We're all in need of Jesus. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak to that one who needs Jesus today. And when the music begins, they would come and say, Pastor, I want to know Christ. I want to know Him. I don't want to put it off any longer. I want to know that I know that I know that Christ is my Savior. Would you pray with me? But Lord, I pray that we would all open our hearts and our hands to you and say, Lord, here I am. All that I have, all that I am is yours. Would you use me to make a difference? Lord, have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Thank you.